I'm James McDuff and I run Eastwith Valley Apple Breeders, a small scale apple breeding project in the west of Wales in the United Kingdom. And this is a short video diary of the jobs and activities that I perform throughout the year in order to maintain and develop this uh, breeding program. I hope it will be of some use to people who are thinking of starting uh, apple breeding. Wales is in the United Kingdom and uh, this is in the Northern Hemisphere with a grid reference of 52.35 degrees north, 4.04 degrees west and um, hence when, when I talk about midwinter here being in the month of January that would equate with July for anyone viewing from the Southern Hemisphere. All my seedling apple trees are grown in 5 litre pots. These pots contain a 50-50 mix of multi-purpose for compost and topsoil. These pots are arranged in nursery beds and each of the seedling apple trees is staked with a bamboo cane. During the winter there are a number of maintenance jobs that are required. First and foremost amongst these is, is weeding across the surface of the pots, removing any cover for overwintering pests and also nibbing in the bud any uh, competition weeds for nutrients once the growing season starts. I also check that the labels are still intact and if necessary I replace them. I'm using small aluminium tags. Each tree has a unique reference number and I emboss these by hand using a biro. I find that these tags are lasting longer than the plastic loop lock tags I used to use. The other really important job to do at this time of the year midwinter is to sow up the seeds or pips that have been collected from the crosses made last year. After they were harvested the seeds were stored in a fridge at a temperature of 4 degrees Celsius for between 60 and 90 days to provide a stratification treatment. Sowing up is simple. All you need is a pot. In my case I use 15 centimetre diameter pots containing a 50-50 mix of multi-purpose compost and a sowing compost such as John Innes number one. You need seeds to sow in these pots and you need labels so that you know what you've sown in which pot. I arrange the seeds on the surface of the soil in the relevant pot Them, preferably on their sides or on their edges, into the soil to a depth of about a centimetre. Next I insert a couple of labels into the pot, referencing the cross number and the number of seeds I've sown, and then I lightly water it. Finally, the pots are placed in a cold frame outside. And this is where the seeds will germinate over the next three or four weeks. It's early February and the next job on the winter to-do list is pruning. As a rule, I try to do as little winter pruning as possible. And in particular, I try to avoid cutting back the single leader on each seedling. This is because I'm trying to encourage the leader to extend as rapidly as possible and to produce as many leaves as possible per year, thereby pass through the juvenile phase where it's unable to flower as rapidly as possible and enter the adult phase where it can flower as quickly as possible. So the only situation in which I would cut back the leader is one of disease. So here's a row of two-year-old seedlings. Some of these seedling trees are over two metres high and so the first thing I'll do is have a look at the state of the leading stem, checking them for any signs of canker and if they are infected then I'll cut these tips back. Then I'll check out the laterals that have been growing off the leading stem during the second year of growth. I try to leave as many of these intact, hoping that they will develop into flowering spurs eventually. But occasionally one finds that 
they're suffering from tip dieback or maybe canker. There's one. So in these cases, I just tip them back. There's another one here. Bit of dieback there. I take this quite far back. Often I take it back to a, an upward facing bud. And then finally, I take a look at the shape of the seedling tree. And if there are any laterals that are particularly long and are in danger of interfering or getting tangled up with a neighbour, I'll just take them back as well. So here's another one here that's just a little bit long, pruning them back. But as I say, I try to leave most of the laterals, particularly the shorter ones, intact. Older seedling trees get the same approach. Minimum pruning where possible, and particularly those in their fifth, sixth and seventh years where many of them are already flowering or about to flower, I really do try to avoid pruning out flowering wood. For example, taking off flowering buds such as these here. Throughout February I'm also going to be checking regularly on the progress of the seeds or pips that I planted during January. It's now just two weeks on from planting and already there are good signs of germination and emergence of seedlings. Daytime temperatures have been between 3 and 9 degrees Celsius and there's also been one or two frosts at night and it's really clear that apple seeds or pips are able to germinate readily at fairly low temperatures. It's March the 8th and spring is just about here, although the overnight temperatures are near to zero Celsius at the moment. Nevertheless, the apple pips or seeds that I sowed up in January, on January the 17th, seven weeks ago, have now, in the main, germinated and emerged to form pretty healthy seedlings. So far the germination rate is about 80%. Uh, it does vary between pots. Each of these pots contains the seeds from a, a different cross they've made, and there's one in the corner there that looks particularly poor, but the majority of them have got pretty reasonable germination rates. The main job I've been doing over the last few days is to top dress all the seedling apple trees I've got with sufficient fertiliser to last them for the whole of this year's growing season. I use a polymer coated controlled release fertiliser for this purpose. In terms of NPK it's 16, 8, 12 and it also includes 2% magnesium oxide and a full range of trace elements. Its total release time is nine months and it's determined by soil temperature. I apply 16 grams of this fertilizer to the surface of each pot. And then I just work it in top three or four centimeters pretty roughly. It's March the 19th and spring has arrived, although it's still very cold with the temperatures ranging between zero and four or five degrees Celsius. This is a row of seedling apple trees about to start their fourth year of growth. One or two of them show signs of flowering buds. The seeds from the crosses that I made last year and planted in January a couple of months ago have germinated and are growing well. They're developing their first pair of true leaves and it's at this stage that I usually transplant them into individual one litre pots. I use either solid plastic or polythene pots uh, both of which are reusable many, many times. Um, and they're filled with a 50-50 mix of John Innes No. 1 and a multi-purpose compost. So the transplanting is very simple. 
much as you do for any seedling. I just dig a little hole and gently place the seedling in and tamp the surrounding soil down and if there's any need to refill the pot a little bit I use some of the spent compost that I've got available. There we go, second one. So the seedlings are quite robust now but they're not too large to be severely damaged when I remove them from the original pot. The last thing I do is double label each pot. And double labeling is very useful because quite often you'll lose a, a plastic label from a pot and if you've got two of them you're always going to know what the identity of the seedling is in terms of its crossing history. There we go. Once transplanted I water the, the pots and then transfer them into another cold frame where they're going to grow for the next eight or nine weeks before being finally transplanted into a five litre pot and then into the ground into nursery beds. It's April the 3rd, a quarter of the way through the year. It's this year's new batch of seedlings sown from seed in mid-January. These are now growing on in cold frames and most of them are producing their third or fourth true leaf. They require watering once or twice a week but other than that it's just a question of keeping an eye open for any aphids or other damaging insects. It's also time to start thinking seriously about which crosses to perform this year and which varieties to use as male and female parents. My own crossing program this year will be conducted along three lines. First to try to improve flavour of early dessert varieties. Secondly to combine high quality and distinctly flavoured uh, mid-season dessert varieties and thirdly to uh, look at uh, interesting combinations of Welsh heritage varieties. It's the 7th of May and there's plenty of blossom around now. Bees are around, pollination is in full swing and it's time to get cracking with this year's crossing program. Two key things to do right now are to finalise which varieties are going to be used as male and female parents and then to prepare the female flowers by removing the male parts of any flower that is going to be pollinated in order to prevent any risk of self-pollination and then to collect the pollen from the varieties that we're going to use as male parents. Okay, let's start with how to prepare female flowers for pollination. You want to pick a cluster such as this one where the individual flowers are still in the balloon phase. In other words, the petals haven't opened, so there's no risk that the flowers could have been pollinated already by insects. I pollinate three flowers on a cluster, and so I remove the other flowers. I just leave one spare in case I make a mistake. I've got these four flowers at the cluster stage of development, and the job now is to open them up individually and remove the male part of the flower, the anthers, the pollen producing organs, to prevent them being self-pollinated. I'll just demonstrate on the central flower here. So I open them up, open the flower up and 
there you can see clustered around the female part of the flower the anthers and I just gently and carefully remove all of these with a pair of tweezers forceps taking care not to squeeze or remove the female part of the flower, the style with the stigmas at the end of it because those are the parts of the flower we're actually going to pollinate. There we are. I've removed all the anthers and we've just got the female part left. And then I leave it be and I do the same to the other two flowers on the cluster. So let's assume I've done that. I'd remove the fourth one, which I haven't done. And then to prevent any insects coming along and pollinating this cluster of flowers before I want to actually perform my own hand pollination, I would just protect it, covering it with a small muslin bag like that. And I would tie the end of it shut using a piece of string with a few beads, colored beads on the end. The reason for the beads being that, say I'm preparing several flowers on a given tree or several clusters on a given tree, they're all going to be pollinated by pollen from different varieties. I want to be able to identify which variety was pollinated which cluster, hence the, the use of a simple marking scheme like these beads. Collecting the pollen uh, for the male parents you're going to use in the crosses is very simple. Again, you want to select flowering clusters that are still in the bloom stage. This one is a little bit loose, they've developed too far, this one's open. Although that's still bloom, it's a little bit loose. It could have been entered by an insect and there could be some pollen contamination there. So maybe this cluster's better. Uh, these are slightly tighter. So the simplest way is just to pick off a few flowers and remove the petals, exposing the central part with the male and female parts in intact. And this, store them in a little plastic vial and let the flowers dry out in that vial until the anthers dehiss or release the pollen. And then you use the flowers with the release pollen on the anthers to actually hand pollinate the female parents that you've selected. If on the other hand you're happy to let nature take its course and for the flowers to ripen naturally uh, then the best thing to do is to identify a cluster of uh, flowers um, several days before you wish to use them. Uh, again, they should be in the balloon phase so that there's no chance that any insects could already have uh, visited them and cross-contaminated them with uh, pollen from other varieties. And when you've found a cluster like this one here, for example, you cover it with a muslin bag to prevent any insects from visiting it and then wait for the flowers to uh, open naturally and for the anthers to ripen naturally and to release the pollen naturally and you'd have to check the cluster every few days but when that has occurred you can then pick the flowers off individually and take them to the female parent and perform the hand pollination that way. It's a, a more long-winded approach and it actually it's the approach I used to use a lot until the last few years when I've actually had not had enough time to to wait and to go around the muslin bags checking whether or not the uh, flowers have actually ripened. So I tend to use the, the the first method I showed you where I just take off the flowers in the bloom stage and let them dry in polythene or plastic vials for a few days and then I use them. It's May the 8th and today I'm going to hand pollinate the cluster of three flowers I prepared yesterday, uh, emasculating them uh, on a sunset apple tree to provide the female parents for a cross I'm going to perform with male parent pollen provided by James Grieve and this pollen you can see here I collected a few days ago from the tree and stored in a small 
plastic vial until the anthers dried out and released the pollen grains and today I'm going to use them to pollinate these three flowers. So the first thing I do is just remove the protective muslin bag. This has been in place to prevent any insects from getting at the flowers before I do. Success rates with pollination are highest on the day that the flowers open. Now the weather's been pretty warm and uh, these flowers are pretty much open. So in order to actually perform the pollination I just pick out a single flower, dried flower from the James Greve tree with its dried anthers that have released pollen and I'm going to gently pass that flower across the female part of the sunset flowers in other words the stigmas five or so stigmas at the center of each flower hoping that some of the pollen will just drop off the anthers and stick to the stigma subsequently fertilize the flower I can just pass across each flower a couple of times it takes just two or three seconds and that's it done and then I usually uh, throw away the, the flower I've used because I presume I've rubbed off a lot of the pollen although if you only got one or two flowers of a favorite or a special male parent variety or cultivar you can just put them back in your plastic container and use them again if you so wish that flower is now pollinated and in order to protect it from unwanted insect visitors that may pollinate it repeatedly and confound the cross I've just cover it again with the same muslin bag tying up the ends and using an identifying number or color of beads attached to the string so that I can always know what this actual cross is. This year I've been lucky enough to have a couple of beehives placed um, amongst my apple trees uh, by some local beekeepers. Um, I was quite keen for this to uh, be done because last year I uh, suspected that my pollination levels were not as high as they could be and of course when it comes to seedling apple trees it's one thing for them to flower but unless they're pollinated and then fertilized you're not going to see the results of the cross in terms of apples so I'm hoping that uh, this year I'll have greater success in terms of uh, fertilization and uh, fruit development through to harvest. This is a really super seedling apple tree. It's coming into its seventh year of growth, flowering properly for the first time this year and it's got a lovely structure, columnar structure with flowering clusters coming off spurs all the way up the single central leader. There's a cross between James Greve and Discovery and uh, who knows what kind of apples it's going to produce. With such profuse blossom this year there's a worry that the flowers that I've hand pollinated might not make it through to harvest. For example, they may well be dropped in the June drop or just be lost by natural thinning. So uh, I thought it might be worth just mentioning one or two tips or ways that I feel one can maximize the chances that the flowers that have been hand pollinated in one's crossing program actually are likely to make it all the way through to producing a harvestable apple. Firstly, when one of the trees I'm using as a, a female parent comes into blossom, I get cracking with hand pollination very quickly and try to pollinate one of the earliest blossoms that are opening. In this way, I, I hope to steal a march on the rest of the 
the trees blossom insofar as the blossom that I pollinated has a competitive advantage, it's got a head start in terms of fertilisation. Another thing I try uh, to do is to pollinate clusters that are not competing with other clusters in their immediate environment or not on the same branch or twig. So in this case, this sort of slightly overcrowded and overblossomed Katy tree, when I pollinated this cluster here, it's now been bagged. I removed a couple of other competing clusters just opposite it on the same branch. Here's an example of a cross onto Lord Lambourne as the female parent. The tree is absolutely plastered with blossom and one might imagine that the cluster I've selected here would have little chance of surviving to uh, harvest. But what I've done with this particular one is that I've removed an adjacent cluster of flowers there and a second one there so that the cluster I've pollinated is the only one coming off this little branch here. So I hope that increases its competitive chances. Another tip that's probably worth uh, bearing in mind, particularly if you're in a, an area that's prone to uh, frosts, and these can be very unpredictable in late April and May, is to spread your crosses and your pollinations over a fairly long time frame. So although, I, as, as I said, I like to get in early on a tree and perform a kind of a, a basic number of crosses, I might well revisit a, a female parent and put a couple of later crosses onto it. A again, this is illustrated in this Honeycrisp uh, tree where I put this cross on maybe a week ago and that cross just yesterday. And to some extent this uh, mitigates the risk of all your crosses being destroyed by frost. Another thing I do is to very carefully select which individual trees I'm going to use as the female parent for a given cross, uh, particularly when I have several um, examples of that variety. I try to pick the trees that I know are good at retaining fruit all the way through to, or a high proportion of fruit, all the way through to harvest as opposed to dropping a lot of them in the June drop. Okay, to sum up, get cracking with your hand pollinations as soon as the tree that you're going to use as the female parent comes into blossom to give the pollinated cluster a head start in terms of competition. Secondly, Try to avoid as much uh, competition from adjacent clusters, either by removing these or selecting the cluster you're going to pollinate uh, as, to be as isolated as possible on a branch. Thirdly, uh, extend your pollination uh, program over quite a wide time scale in order to hedge against the unpredictable uh, occurrence of frost and frost damage. And fourthly, Take care in selecting the trees that you're going to use as female parents uh, and use those that are as reliable as possible in terms of retaining a high proportion of pollinated uh, fruit all the way through to um, harvest. It's May the 19th and uh, the weather's been fine for the last few days. Many varieties are still in full blossom, but quite a number have come to the end or are approaching the end of the blossom. So it's time to take a look at uh, some of the crosses that I've made and where there's no chance of any further contaminating uh, insect pollination of the crosses, I'm going to remove the muslin bags. So this is a cross here that I made uh, about a week ago using Irish peach as the male parent and so I will just remove the muslin bag that's been protecting it. I'm pretty sure that 
the flowers are no longer in a state where they can be pollinated and that the stigmas will have shriveled and yeah, I can see here that they are pretty much, I would say, yeah, they've gone brown and certainly these two are probably beyond pollination and I'd take a punt on that. And So it looks to me as if three out of three of the flowers that I hand pollinated are fertilised at this particular point in time. So I'll leave them uncovered but I'll retie the the bead tag so that I know the identity of this cross because of course there are other crosses on this tree I don't want to get them mixed up. The other thing I'm doing today is uh, a little bit of uh, last minute pruning or if you like very early summer pruning of seedlings where I feel there's a need to encourage the uh, main leading shoot, the single leader uh, to grow away and to establish apical dominance such that there are not a lot of lateral shoots being produced. So this is a row of uh, seedling trees going into their third year of growth and last year a lot of them were they didn't make very good growth one reason or another. Some of them were attacked by aphids, others had fairly serious thrip damage of the uh, terminal bud and so some of them are starting life this year with really poor um, elongation of the leading shoot and in some cases you can't even recognize it. So for example in this seedling here, it's uh, reasonably tall, about a metre, 20 centimetres, but up at the tip here you can't really see a nice clean dominant leading shoot. So what I'm doing here is either pruning with a secateurs or just pinching out some of the competing laterals that are coming off very close to the uh, leader and I'm leaving it looking very much like that. Here's another seedling where the leader isn't growing away without uh, a lot of competition from laterals up at the uh, top of the seedling. So once again I'm going to try and reduce the competition here and cut away one or two of the competing laterals and I'm going to remove that one so that we're looking a bit bit better there and I might actually take that one out there and that one there and that is going to leave the leading shoot without a lot of competition at the top of the seedling and with a bit of luck it'll begin to grow away fast and re-establish a, a level of or a degree of apical dominance because of course what I'm trying to encourage is very rapid elongation of the single main leader and the achievement of the maximum number of leaf nodes per year so that the seedlings can as quickly as possible pass through the juvenile phase and be in a position to flower. It's the 5th of June and summer has arrived. All the uh, apple varieties have finished flowering now and it's time to take a look at the crosses that I made and remove the muslin bags that have been protecting the pollinated flowers for the last two or three weeks. Okay, so here's a um, pollinated cluster on a young Lady Lambourne tree. The Lady Lambourne being a, a red sport of Lord Lambourne and I'm looking at the identifying tag here. Two green beads. I think this has been uh, pollinated by Gladstone. Anyway, we'll have a look and see whether any of the flowers have been fertilised. Looking at the rest of the tree, certainly the fruitlets are developing pretty well. So I'm expecting to see some good news. Yep, that's a robust one. So I've got two out of three of the flowers that are hand pollinated are on their way to producing fruits. That's pretty good. Um, I might expect to lose one of those two fruits before harvest, but we should at least carry one on. 
So I must remember to retie the identifying bead, otherwise I won't be able to recognise the crossed or the, the product of the cross when I come back to look at it again. Looking around this tree I can see another uh, cross I've just taken the bag off here and there's only one out of three flowers has reached this stage. Fertilisation and a week or two of uh, fruitlet growth. Um, and then there's another one here which has two out of three flowers have obviously been fertilised and are developed now into fruitless. So that's pretty good going. It's June the 15th and it's now several weeks since I performed this year's crosses and I'm just having a little look round to see how they're doing. I can see on this tree here which is well in the mill there's a cross there which is marked with the three beads and I've got three out of three fruit that's developing, that's pretty good. There's another one there which has one pretty healthy fruit and one that may well drop off during June as part of the June drop self thinning but uh, so far so good. We had a really profuse blossom this year and there's already been quite a bit of self thinning going on. The other job I'm doing uh, at the moment is potting up the seedlings that have been growing on since January this year and are now 10, 20, 30 centimetres high after a matter of five or six months growth and they're just beginning to get a bit leggy for these one litre pots so I'm transplanting them into five litre pots which will then be sunk into the ground and the seedling trees will be grown on in those pots until they flower in three, four, five or even six years time. To pot these seedlings up uh, it's pretty straightforward. Five litre plastic pots with a 50-50 mix of topsoil and multi-purpose compost. Uh, I actually filled these a few weeks ago and they dried out rather because we had very dry weather so they'll need a good water when I put the seedling in. Here's one of the seedlings in its one litre pot and I'll just make a hole for it pretty in this pot and tap it out. These are quite damp because I've had to water them nearly every day because of the warm weather. That's one of the reasons why I'm quite keen to pot them up now. It might lessen the frequency which I have to water them and then tamp the compost back down, a little shake. I fill these pots pretty full because what I find happens is that the uh, volume of soil and compost decreases over the years. I guess it's because of the oxidation of the uh, organic matter in the multi-purpose compost component. Double label each pot and then because it gets quite windy I don't want the seedlings to break. At this stage I just put in a fairly thin plant stick and tie this onto the or tie the seedling onto this. Taking care not to damage it because they're quite fragile at this stage. And there we are. That's now ready um, to uh, go into the ground or be sunk half into the ground in the nursery bed later on but uh, until then I'll just line them up uh, on the grass out here. As I say they'll just wait here for a few weeks until I can get around to sinking them into the ground semi-permanently. It's the 18th of July and uh, the summer's turning out to be very dry with no significant rainfall now for going on uh, for eight weeks I guess. So uh, uh, many of the seedling apple trees are beginning to show signs of drought and uh, they are requiring watering every few days. This 
particular seedling here has got a fair number of uh, brown and shriveled leaves. The trees tend to uh, drop a fraction of their uh, leaves as a response to uh, drought and as a mechanism for uh, reducing water loss through evapotranspiration. So I'm not too worried as long as I don't see total leaf death and I expect that this particular seedling will recover in the autumn and hopefully grow on next year. But as I said, I am having now to water the, the pots on a fairly regular basis. So what I've done in order to um, uh, limit evaporative loss is to mulch the, the surface of the soil with, uh, well, essentially dried grass. Looking at the seedlings that uh, have grown from the seeds I sowed this January, about seven months ago, uh, well, they're looking a bit the worse for wear as a result of the very dry weather. And despite the fact that I've been watering the pots, a number of them are showing pretty severe symptoms of leaf scorch. And uh, in one or two cases, the seedlings have died. I'll have to transplant these into their semi-permanent uh, nursery bed positions where the pots are sunk into the ground over the next week or so and hopefully most of them will recover and grow away at a better rate next year. You can see here an example of uh, sun scorch as a result of the hot and very dry weather we've had. Many of the crosses that I performed uh, during April and May are looking pretty good in terms of apple production. Although I probably lost about uh, half of them in total uh, as a result of uh, natural thinning on the trees, uh, pest burden, pest damage and the effects of drought. It's the 27th of July and it's time that uh, this year's batch of young seedling apple trees was transplanted into their permanent nursery bed positions. I transplant the seedlings in these five litre pots into nursery beds like this one with pots sunk about halfway into the soil just to improve anchorage and to help with uh, moisture or water supply once the uh, roots of the seedlings uh, inevitably pass through the drainage holes in the bottom of the pot. So it's a very simple procedure. Just dig a very shallow hole in the soil which is very dry this year so it's quite difficult to make much of a, a hole at all and remove the soil and then it's a question of inserting the pot. They don't have to be all inserted at exactly the right depth. Sometimes you might come across a stone, a large stone that's just not worth moving or a little bit of root system from an adjacent tree that you don't necessarily want to destroy. But it's always a question of just tamping the soil, the loose soil, back round the pot. When the seedlings are established and have grown on for another few months, I'll put up a timber frame uh, at uh, either end of nursery beds and string some wire between the ends and then tie the seedlings to bamboo stakes and the stakes to the wire frame just to provide a bit of stability. It's the 13th of August and summer's uh, pushing on now. Just a, a month or so to go before many of the uh, main season varieties of apple will be ready for harvest. Likewise, some of the fruits that have developed from the crosses that I performed in May are also just about ready to be harvested and the pips removed. There's one here with uh, a number marked on it for identification. Also, the bead system is still in use. And I've also put a sock on this because 
This particular variety, Ellison orange, tends to be uh, a favourite with birds and other and wasps and other insects. So this is just designed to dissuade them from damaging the fruit, because once that occurs, uh, when rot set in, the uh, apples often drop prematurely and before the pips are actually properly ripened. Over the last two weeks there's been considerable uh, rainfall and this has relieved the uh, prolonged drought that we'd experienced earlier in the summer. And that uh, drought period had really stunted the growth of the seedling apple trees, whether they were two, three, four or five year old ones. You can now see that many of the seedling trees, this one is a two year old for example, are beginning to recover in terms of extension growth to the uh, single main leading shoot and the new growth looks to be pretty disease and pest free. Here we have the first year seedlings that are the result of the pips I sowed up this January so they're now just about seven months old and once more they've been fairly badly stunted by the, the drought we had this summer and that's despite my watering regime but since the rainy weather resumed you can see some nice fresh green growth at the uh, tips of these seedlings It's August the 21st and many of the um, apples that have developed from crosses I made this year are nearing maturity and will need to be harvested pretty soon. So I'm being quite vigilant, uh, inspecting them regularly and checking for any signs of bird damage. This year, uh, probably as a result of the uh, prolonged dry weather we had in the early part of the summer, there's been quite a lot of insect damage to the uh, top of the seedlings, to the terminal bud zone, and this is a, has stunted some of the um, extension growth. It's recovering now that we've got some wetter weather, but uh, in some cases growth pretty much packed up for uh, six or seven weeks, and um, in other cases when it's resumed the apical dominance has been uh, broken and so we've got the uh, extension growth occurring on multiple shoots and so in these instances I'm snipping them out or snipping out the laterals that have started to grow uh, in an attempt to restore uh, the dominance of the central leader. As far as the older seedling trees go those uh, in their fifth, sixth, seventh years of growth, some of whom are flowering or have flowered this year, but the majority of, of which probably will flower next year, I hope. Um, I'm embarking on a pretty comprehensive round of summer pruning. Um, this is really because of the system I'm growing these trees under. It's getting a little bit out of hand. As you can see, they're very closely spaced, about 30 centimetres or a foot apart in these five litre pot sunk into the ground and so as the seedling trees uh, get older the lateral growth tends to um, spread across from one uh, to another of the trees and the uh, overall effect is getting very very uh, sort of complex and tangled and resulting in reduced light um, penetration and uh, so what I'm doing is cutting back most uh, of the laterals to about six seven inch max length hopefully either um, to about between three and five leaf buds on the current year's growth or if I have to go beyond that into last year's growth I'm cutting back to an outward facing potential flowering bud and the idea really is to produce a columna, minaret or cordon like growth form where you've got this central leader with a number of um, short flowering spur laterals coming off the leader all the way up it. So looking at this uh, seedling here and this particular lateral here I'll take this one down beyond this year's growth which began there into last year's growth and I think I'll cut it all the way back to 
the second uh, bud from its origin. That's quite a nice compact. And I'll go around the, most of these buds or most of these shoots, cutting them back likewise. So here's one that I've, uh, a row that I've done in terms of pruning, and you can see that the majority of the laterals have been shortened. Most of them are still a fair few inches in length but the overall effect is a little bit more compact and there's a lot less interference uh, with adjacent trees. I have a couple of worries about uh, this type of pruning. The first is that um, there will be continued regrowth from the cut ends of the uh, laterals that I've pruned back. Uh, in other words, that uh, extension growth really hasn't quite ceased for the season, although leaving the pruning to the third and fourth weeks of August and being aware that many of the lateral uh, shoots appear to have stopped extending, I should be relatively safe here. Uh, but the other worry is that I'll have cut off quite a number of uh, florally induced buds that may, may well have gone on to flower next year and so I may uh, inadvertently uh, reduce the number of seedling trees that I actually see flowering next year. Sixth of September and there's a definite feel of autumn in the air. It's very much now time to collect the uh, results of crosses that I made this year. Um, this little tree here happens to be Honeycrisp. Anyway, I've used it as the uh, female parent in a number of crosses this year because it seems to take pretty well in terms of fertilization. So I've got two crosses here, numbers 86 and 85, and they are crosses with Ananas, Renette, and Pitmast and Pineapple, respectively. So I'm going to collect the fruit from cross 86 here. I've protected these um, developing apples basically from wasp and other insect attack and to some extent bird damage as well. And it's just a question of picking them. And these I'll now store for a few weeks um, in a shed somewhere uh, until I extract the pips from them. And then in there, in uh, turn, the pips will be stored for a couple of months at four degrees in the um, fridge to stratify them before they get sown up in the new year, January. The other job I've uh, been continuing with is the summer pruning of the older seedling trees, i.e. those who are maybe in their third to uh, sixth or seventh year of growth. This row here is a row in their fourth year of growth. One or two of them have flowered this year, but the majority haven't, and I've been continuing to prune back the lateral um, shoots to, uh, well, really a maximum of a five, six, seven inches. It's the 11th of September, and I'm going to say a few words about uh, tasting the apples that uh, result from crosses that have been made. You'll notice with this particular row that very few of the seedling trees still have any fruit on them and that's because I was a bit slow off the mark this uh, year in terms of tasting and many of them were uh, damaged by birds and insects beyond uh, uh, rescue and uh, the others I've already actually had a look at. I've got one seedling tree left here with a number of apples on. This is actually a, uh, quite a promising or potentially pro promising cross between Discovery and Lord Lambourne and uh, it's the third year uh, in succession that this is fruited and uh, I tend to uh, take several years to uh, evaluate uh, whether an apple is decent because sometimes uh, you'll have a seasonal or a year climatic effect on flavour 
and uh, that can be quite significant. So it's probably wise to, uh, if one has the space and the time, to persist for two or three years to get an overall feel for how uh, a new apple is performing. Unfortunately, although this has two very august and flavoursome appearance, this particular cross, or the result of this cross, is pretty tasteless. Uh, it looks reasonable, and it's got a reasonable size, but when it comes to the crunch, it's very bland. So here goes. Mm. It's pretty crunchy and has a definite appley flavour, but it's so mild that really you'd have a hard time finishing an apple like this. There are one or two useful points illustrated by this uh, particular tree, despite the fact that the apples don't taste very good. The start, as you can see here, that uh, this particular apple there has been badly damaged by birds and probably then subsequently by wasps. And so, if you're looking at a seedling tree with only one or two fruit on that are likely to develop to uh, maturity, then it's well worth covering them or considering covering and protecting those fruits from damage using, uh, for example, uh, well, a muslin bag. Or you can use the uh, disposable nylon socks that you can obtain pretty easily and just slip them over to protect the fruit until it's time to um, taste it. And of course, when you're faced with a tree for the first time, with bearing apples for the first time, you're not 100% sure when they're ripe, so you may have to revisit that tree and taste a succession of apples over maybe a, a period of weeks, or several weeks at least. Um, and so in that case, you would probably want to have more than one apple protected from damage by birds and insects. Evaluating most of the uh, fruit produced by seedling trees doesn't take very long, because as in this case, you've got a, an apple here that is it's perfectly reasonable to look at, but it just doesn't taste much good. So you're not going to take this any further. It would be written off from this point forward, especially as in this case, this is the third year running that I've looked at this particular seedling tree, and it's the third year running that I've really kind of given a thumbs down to it in terms of taste. However, you know, when it comes to fruit that shows a lot more kind of potential and could well uh, past muster, you might want to do a much more involved evaluation. So if you're going to go to town in terms of evaluation, you'll want to draw up either your own pro forma with uh, characteristics and tick them off one at a time, or use uh, some of the pro formas for um, fruit evaluation that are out there, for example on the internet. One of the most comprehensive uh, evaluation checklists I've come across is that uh, produced by the Midwest Apple Improvement Association in the United States. It really does have a lot of categories that you can check through or check uh, down as you uh, evaluate. 22nd of October and uh, we're in the middle of autumn. Most uh, of the uh, apple varieties been harvested. One or two Bramleys left there on that tree. And the same goes for all the crosses that uh, I made earlier this year. All the resulting fruit have been harvested and the pips have been removed now. And the results have been bagged out with a little bit of vermiculite and they're going to go into the fridge for 60 to 90 days at a temperature of around about 4 degrees Celsius in order to stratify them and uh, once they've had this uh, treatment they'll be sewn into pots and that will be at the beginning of January. One of the pruning decisions I've uh, made uh, this winter uh, concerns how I'm going to treat seedlings that have flowered. During the first few years of growth I've tried to encourage 
maximum rate of um, extension of a single leader in these seedlings and it takes you know between three four five six years for these seedlings to actually flower but as a result of that uh, type of growth they're becoming a lot of them are becoming very very tall so I've decided to substantially cut the leader back on any seedling trees that have actually flowered. Um, I've marked these with a, a red tie here and so I'm going to cut these back to about seven foot. It's a balance between losing a number of uh, obviously potentially flowering buds and ease of management but I've decided that really I want to be able to manage these kind of rows of seedling trees from the ground without the use of a ladder and that's why this winter I'm going to go around cutting them back like this. There we go. That's back to about seven foot. I think I'll still have a few flowering buds there. The first year seedlings that have grown from pips that I sowed up in uh, January, just about a year ago, haven't done particularly well this year because primarily of the prolonged summer drought. So the majority of them are only 40, 50 centimetres tall and I just have to hope that next season or next year they'll make up for this uh, rather stunted growth. However, many of the older seedling trees survived pretty well and grew on throughout the drought this year and uh, they look in reasonable condition. So I've reached the end of uh, the year as far as this um, diary of my apple breeding efforts go and uh, it only remains for me to say uh, thanks for watching and I hope that those of you who are uh, starting um, out as uh, apple breeders at whatever kind of scale you uh, are going to adopt may have found one or two useful uh, tips or uh, a little bit of a guidance that you may be able to apply to your own efforts and um, all I can say is good luck I hope you have a, a great deal of fun and success in your apple breeding enterprise.